Welcome to all of you to this webinar with us. We're very happy to have you with us today and um, hope that you will enjoy our presentation. My name is Luisa Weiss. I work for the ICLI Capacity Center and I will facilitate this webinar from the technical side. I want to introduce you quickly to how we use the technical system that you have logged on to. So for the duration of the presentation, you will be muted. That means you are in listen-only mode and cannot speak. However, we warmly welcome your questions and comments to the presentation. And please do so by typing them for us. Type them into the question box that you see in front of you in the GoToWebinar interface. We will have a question and answer session in the end of the webinar and will then engage with you and uh, answer your questions. Today's presentation will be given by Yunus Arikan, our Head of Global Policy and Advocacy, who is also the UNFCCC designated contact point for ICLI. I'm handing over to you, Yunus. Thanks a lot, Luisa. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's a great pleasure to share this next hour with you in our the discussion on what has happened in Paris during COP21, what were key outcomes and what we can do in the future or how we can design the future under these conditions or under these given outcomes. Um, as as in the content of our presentation, we'll also focus on these uh, headlines. Um, we will also go through the Paris Climate Package in a bit more detail. Um, and we will, in this presentation, you can also see a couple of photos from selected scenes uh, and, and both of the, the PowerPoint uh, and the recorded webinar will be uploaded on the homepage of Local Government Climate Roadmap uh, after this session. Uh, so, COP21 Paris was remarkable in many uh, senses. It was record-breaking record uh, statistics, uh, level of participation, the scale, number of participants, the diversity of events. It was on, almost unusual in terms of uh, different uh, capacities and different engagements. Um, so that was a remarkable achievement. Uh, so under these conditions, what we can, when we look look back, we can consider five key type of elements, uh, five key types of events that we have been involved. Uh, there were some events outside the, the UNFCC Blue Zone, which was very particularly relevant for us, for local and subnational governments. There were events in the Blue Zone. We had Lima Paris Action Agenda events. There were some events in Paris and special events. In this part, in this page, you can see those who had specific outcomes. Therefore, that would be more relevant for our work. It does not make a complete coverage, of course, but these are the main highlights from our point of view. So the first uh, type of events, in fact, uh, throughout these two weeks, there were two core events that we have been engaged as local and subnationals. The first one was, of course, the 4th of December Climate Summit for Local Leaders uh, at the Paris City Hall. This was hosted by Mayor of Paris and Michael Bloomberg, UN Special Envoy for Climate Change and Cities. It was a massive mobilization in terms of the number of local leaders and the participants there as their partners. It concluded with a declaration. There was also a the document called 21 Solutions to Adopt, Curb and Engage. Uh, there was impressive uh, lineup from a number of heads of states and, and, and negotiators, UNFCC negotiators, as well as UN Secretary General, who also announced the, his next uh, initiative, which is a Climate Action Summit in 2016. This was a day in event, but uh, throughout the two weeks, a uh, majority of our activities was hosted in the Cities and Regions Pavilion, in the Green Zone, in the Le Bourget. It was uh, a, a two-week session. Uh, it was host uh, in the venue of 120 events, uh, which uh, was followed by, which were followed by 1,800 plus people, participants. 
including 200 mayors and leaders. Uh, core element of the pavilion was the presentation of the transformative actions program, which was our response to scale up uh, ambitions in the in the run up to Paris and beyond. These were presented by local and subnational government representatives who were submitting these projects and activities. This was the main of the coverage outside. Uh, in the blue zone, we had three main type of events. We had the daily uh, constituency meetings of local and subnational local governments and municipal authorities constituency. This enabled us to consult internally about our key positions, the draft our, our inputs to the negotiations, and and prepare our interventions in the high level segment, ADP, and opening and closing plenaries. Uh, in the side events, uh, it was also an impressive uh, number of diversity of organizations and, and, and uh, hosts, uh, hosts of, of those uh, events. We had a regular UNFCC side event program, but in addition to that, uh, a number of parties, including European Union, US, China, Japan, Netherlands, Germany, France, they all hosted a number of events organized uh, with or together with or, or by your local and subnational governments. Uh, a couple of events was hosted by UNFCC Secretariat. This includes uh, a dialogue on, on subnationals and also a Momentum for Change urban poor section. The uniqueness of COP uh, was this year that there was a special work stream called Lima Paris Action Agenda under the leadership of COP presidencies of uh, Peruvian and French government as well as UN Secretary General and UN Climate Change Secretariat. This was mainly 12 thematic sessions and uh, the core deliverables that came out of those 12 was particularly important for us was a five-year region of cities and regions the Global Alliance on Buildings and Construction and E-Mobility Declaration. There were many other announcements, but these were the most relevant ones. Uh, and as a part of this Lima Paris Action Agenda, 5th of December was the High Level Action Day, and there was a separate uh, event focusing on local and subnational leadership, and a number of mayors and governors were also speaking there. Uh, Outside the UNFCC venue, there were a number of events in the city hall, in the city of Paris, in the various venues. Uh, these were mainly an opportunity of dialogue and, and partnerships. But one of the key outcomes was uh, an event organized by UNESCO, focusing on mega cities alliance for water and climate change. And finally, uh, the constituencies have also hosted their own events. They had their own. Uh, body meetings and, and including some new announcements. For example, a number of cities and regions, including City of Paris, Brussels Capital Region, and Quebec government, investing uh, or donating resources to Green Climate Fund or G Global Environment Facility. And after the conclusion of the whole um, COP21, there was an initiative called Paris Pledge for Action, which was a gathering of uh, non party stakeholders from all parts of the world. Um, who expressed their support to the outcome of Paris and, and many of the local and subnational government networks and their members were also engaged in this process. So these were in, in, in the, let's say, day-to-day -day or a physical appearance of what has achieved, what has been achieved in terms of uh, physical activities. Uh, let's uh, have a focus on the key outcome of the COP21, which is the Paris Climate Package, as we call it, because it includes, in fact, a decision, but a decision itself, there is an annex, which is the one document that will be ratified or signed by national governments. So when we say Paris Climate Package, we are talking about a document that will be open for signature and it will be ratified by parliaments or legislative bodies or executive orders by heads of states, and there is another decision there's a decision which is immediately in effect, which is much more technical details of the implementation of this Paris Agreement, including the time until its uh, in enforcement or, or, or including additional technical uh, preparations that will take place. Uh, a key interesting thing that is included in the is in the interesting in the Paris Agreement is that it does not contain any annex uh, con compared to UN in a climate convention or or create a protocol. This is a bit um, in, in giving flexibility on the long run, and we will touch to that later on. Of course, one key essential is the, the number of parties who ratify the, the agreement so that it comes into force. In the draft version of that, there was a, an idea that uh, it will only come into force in 2020, but the new uh, adopted decision says that as soon as it reaches to 55, 
countries and if these represent 55% of global emissions, it can come into force. This gives a strong uh, need uh, for all the civil society and, and, and the stakeholders to continue to, to pressure their governments and to, to uh, raise the profile of the momentum of Paris so that uh, the, the, the agreement is immediately signed and ratified, so this will also be an issue in the days forward. When, it look at, when we look at the agreement text itself, uh, there is one specific preambular paragraph 50, uh, 15 which uh, recognizes the importance of engagement of all levels of government and various actors, but of course the term all levels of governments were particularly important for local and subnational governments and that proves us that, that this new ways the new climate regime is now fully recognizing and engaging local and subnational governments as we have been asking for. There are a couple of references to adaptation and capacity building and loss and damage, but this can be relatively uh, minor compared to the importance of the preamble 15. However, in the, the decision itself, which is much more lengthy and much more detailed, there are certain paragraphs, non-party stakeholders and it's, 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 it, their role in the process, including their engagement in the technical examination process, including their uh, relations also with uh, the high-level event. Uh, so there is much more detailed description of how they can be engaged in the process. And with this complete package, we can say that Paris Agreement is really an inclusive process that has never been achieved before. The key issue, inclusiveness, is also the, the term non-party stakeholders that we want to specifically highlight that. Uh, it, it, it is described as it's uh, in the preamble paragraph, it contains a number of groups, interest groups, and cities and subnational authorities are one part of it. And if we look at the, the whole description, we can immediately uh, conclude that non-party stakeholders is a group of, of stakeholders that are including local and subnational governments as, as those who are accountable to public and they are also legally uh, binding in terms of their decisions and management process and other non-state actors of the society. So that is an important differentiation because um, there was a number of uh, phrases used in here and there, but the term non-party stakeholders is the most inclusive and comprehensive one from our point of view, including local and subnational governments. Well, this is the overall, uh, let's say, objective presentation of what it is, uh, what it's contained. But if we can have a, a bird's eye point of view, we can highlight five main issues in terms of the, the highlights of the, this decision and also it's it's uh, the way it was des designed. The first thing is that throughout the two weeks we have seen. Everybody did their homework from Copenhagen. Everybody had lessons learned, secretariat, parties, local and subnational governments, and civil society. So in that sense, nobody, uh, everybody did their best to prevent any failure and any mistake. So that was really well respected by everybody. In that sense, it is a huge success of the climate community. One key thing is that the whole Paris Agreement is building on the spirit of Lima, which is already an acknowledging that the main commitments will come from the capitals, the decisions at the capitals, and and the the, the monitoring and review process at the at the UN URFCC level will be relatively loose compared to Kyoto Protocol. This is one of the differentiation position, uh, and the the third dimension we have to respect and acknowledge and, and applaud is the the, the more uh, the the parties listen to each other and talk to each other and respect to the priorities of each other, they can come to a conclusion. That was one of the unique aspects of, of the climate conference, especially in the in the run-up to the final days. Um, the more the voices of the, the most vulnerable countries heard, the more uh, the process was much more, let's say, owned by everybody, and that supported probably the whole outcome as such. And in fact, when we look at that, we can conclude also the, 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 the success of the Paris Agreement is that it has acknowledged that there is a there is an unstoppable transformation uh, across all levels and sectors and communities in the society, be it from spiritual groups to, to business sector, be it from uh, northern uh, or southern uh, communities all around the world, there was a, a commitment that we are going we are changing track to a low carbon and high resilience societies. And of course, 
these were also, most of them were captured in the climate summit in 2014, and, and the beauty of the Paris Agreement that all of them are now incorporated into the NFCC process somehow, which means that now the new regime is uh, addressing and giving room for everybody. And this concludes to our final comment on the whole picture is that, in fact, with Paris Agreement, uh, the world is now opening a race to the top, which is the fact that uh, if we want this to be ambitious, if, this, if we want this to be uh, implemented effectively, the main actors are the ones at the national level. So all those actors who would uh, influence the national decisions will be the key responsibility. Therefore, any global and regional partnerships will mainly focus on strengthening the, 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 the efforts at the national level. One important thing is that because of this, there is no lists, no annexes, and no uh, uh, let's say prerequisites to take action, it is possible to expect that uh, in the future, once the, the, the process starts rolling out, uh, there will be no party to be able to keep the rest of the other parties as a hostage of, of, of action. Or we can also interpret in the sense that there may be some parties who may step out because of their national decisions, but the rest of the world, as long as they are committed to the climate action and ambitious track, they will not stop. They will not wait for the others. That I think is interesting because we know political uh, decisions at the national level may change. We have seen it in a number of countries. But it will give us the opportunity that the new spirit of Paris Agreement is that we are on a new track, the train has left station, and if there is any government who doesn't want to be active or ambitious, it will be mainly it's their responsibility and their national actors should be held accountable so that their national governments come back to the process again. But meanwhile, those who want to run faster, those who want to go advanced, they could go forward and they can continue to take commitments and actions. And of course, the last thing is that the, the key provisions in the agreement is that there is a, a there is a commitment to go towards a 1.5 degrees goal, and of course this is in an urban this is a world that is more and more urban, and of course it is totally different than the world that we are aware of today. The way we design our cities, the way we consume, the way we mobilize our our communities will totally be different if we are really serious about reaching to this 1.5 degrees goal. Therefore. Any action, any contribution by any actor, and in particular local and subnational governments, will be uh, an essential requirement and will be a key factor, a defining factor in the success of this new regime. This is how we can foresee the whole Paris climate package in its sense, in its entirety. And if we look at to what we as local and subnational governments have achieved, we can have a, a conclusion also that we have started this journey in Bali in 2007 and this was uh, an aim to 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 respond to the to the national governments when they were saying that yes now we will design a new uh, climate regime and that, that in this climate regime we were advocating that the local and subnational governments should be recognized engaged and empowered if we look at uh, these 15 elements uh, we can easily say that in all these uh, work streams, we had made significant progress. We had, in terms of recognition, we had official COP decisions that recognize us, and in, and in particular in the Paris Agreement, a long-term strategic document, we are also recognized as an important actor by all levels of government. We have 2010 and 2013 decisions as well that is backing up. Uh, in terms of engagement, uh, especially in the last three years in the ADP process mainly, uh, but throughout the, the period since uh, Copenhagen, we had a number of ministerial mayor dialogues. We have intensive discussions on uh, technical uh, uh, workshops where local and subnational representatives were taking part on it. We have uh, responded to climate summit deliverables by Compact of Mayors, Compact of States and Regions, Covenant of Mayors and under two MOU, which was well received by the UN community and the global partners. We have seen more and more governments to have local and subnational delegations. We have now secured that political leaders can be recognized with a special badge and, and the, the Lima Paris Action Agenda is giving us really the opportunity to showcase our successes. We have now a Friends of Cities at the UNFCC, which is giving us the opportunity to engage more actively. We have a work plan at the capacity building level, 
which gives us the opportunity that we can create a new level of partnership which can be strengthened strengthened with the Lima Paris Action Agenda as well. And of course, one thing that is encouraging us is that more than 50% of the submitted INDCs in 2015 have had some sense of a local and subnational climate action, which is giving us the confidence that we will be much more engaged in the process. Uh, and we have referred that there is much more uh, advanced cities who have resources available who can contribute to the global uh, financing models and financing uh, mechanisms. This is also giving us uh, the opportunity that local and subnational governments can be more actively engaged and sub strengthen the global efforts. In terms of empowering, yes, there are cities who are supporting the funds, but there are still an, a huge need of these monies flowing to the developing countries, cities, uh, and regions. And in that sense, we have new programs such as Global Environment Facility Integrated Action Program. We have new initiatives like Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance. We have initiatives from European Union on Climate Kick and Local. Uh, there is uh, an initiative of UN agencies on Subnational Climate Action Hub. Uh, these are giving us the confidence that there will be more opportunities of partnerships in the days ahead. And we, from a bottom-up perspective, as local and subnational governments, have developed our transformative actions program. These, the first batches of this uh, program was presented in Paris, which was uh, wide-ranging uh, in terms of north, south, east, west, in particular to showcase how cities and regions can develop ambitious actions that are uh, also cross-cutting in terms of sector-wise and also inclusive in terms of stakeholder in the engagement. And of course, in final words, throughout 2015 we have seen so many achievements that in all of them there is some sort of a recognition of local and subnational governments. These can give us the confidence that after eight years of our work, our advocacy has bared its fruits, we are much better off, and this gives us also the confidence that in the new agreement we can be much more actively involved. And this should also be something that supports the global process. One thing, I will not go to the details uh, of this slide. It is mainly re repeating of what we have seen in the previous slide, but it also shows you how each year we had made step-by-step -step progress. And that is one of the strengths of the local government climate roadmap from our point of view that we have always uh, in, encouraged and we have uh, recognized our previous achievements and we have always want made a step further based on the, 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 the previous uh, achievements. This gave us the confidence that we can build upon our, our uh, incremental successes and at the end we can reach to a much bigger uh, scaled up uh, results and in th that sense uh, I think the, the whole community of local and subnational governments should be proud in the way they worked, interacting, and, and demonstrated how they can be a trusted partner to the rest of the community. And here is our last slide. Uh, what is the challenge ahead of us? Of course, we are proud and we are happy, but it is not over, especially, as we have said, we have a 1.5 degree goal. We already have a goal on uh, uh, climate neutrality around the mid-century of, of this year, this century, uh, and all of these will take place in a world that is much more urbanized. Uh, so the main challenge is uh, how to engage all levels of government, and in particular, this brings us to the governance issues. In that sense, we have four main areas. We will see in UNFCC, the climate convention process, uh, a number of processes that will have to be synergized. We have a continuation of the technical examination process. We will have to see how the, the initiatives that was released under Lima Paris Action Agenda will be taken up forward in terms of their implementation. We have a new element in the, in the process. Now we have the COP champions. The first champion was announced as Laurence Tibiana. She was the special envoy of the French delegation, French government, on the way to Paris, and she played a key role in bringing parties together to achieve the Paris outcome. So we are confident that her presence and leadership will also help uh, to raise the ambitions further, especially on the way to uh, 22nd of April and onwards. And of course, she will be backed up with an additional champion, and both of them will have to also contribute in the UNFCC process as well. And in the UNFCC, we have to have a close understanding of what will be the work of the Paris Committee on Capacity Building. That will be interesting for us. At the UN level, this year is interesting because and more and more 
uh, outcomes are now feeding into a governance uh, de debate. We have mentioned that there is a subnational climate action hub about among five UN agencies. This is giving us the confidence that the UN system will make a more holistic approach in terms of the work with the citizens of nationals. We will see this year uh, new leaders that will take forward the key institutions like UN Secretary General, United Nations Environment Program, and UN Climate Change Secretariat. So all these names, Ayim Steiner, Christiana Figueres, and Ban Ki-moon will be replaced based on a, a process that will be managed as appropriate. But of course, the new leaders will also give some shape to the future mission of the organizations, or at least the style of the implementation. So we have to be a, following how this whole new leadership will be evolved. And of course, there is one more new information. The, 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 the executive director of the Green Climate Fund will also be uh, replaced this year. And of course, under all these conditions, there's one unique element for us because we will have Habitat 3 this year, which will result in some uh, new achievements in terms of the new urban agenda. But we will also have to see how sustainable development goals and high-level political forum will all interact with each other. At the national level, there's still no uh, clarity on how many nations and how many how diverse these nations will come in New York on 22nd of April. And this gives us the mandate and responsibility for all stakeholders to increase our uh, lobbying and advocacy at the national level so that we ask our national governments to demonstrate that they stick to their commitment in Paris, their heads of state come to New York or as soon as possible sign the agreement and the parliamentarians should immediately ratify the Paris Agreement so that uh, the world is uh, building the trust that we are on track for a new climate regime and a new uh, civilization as such. And of course, as we have referred to the 1.5 degrees, we have to increase the, 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 the commitments under the nationally determined contributions because there is no way that we can reach to this 1.5 degrees with existing contributions. And this the last words brings us to how local and subnational governments can be engaged in this process. There's one first uh, requirement is that we have to increase our existing ambitions. We have to go back to our municipal councils or regional councils and then we have to ask our mayors and subnational leaders to revise their existing commitments and even go further. But more importantly, we have to develop new modalities how we can work with those commitments uh, to strengthen and increase the national ones because we are already aware that some of these commitments are supplementary to the existing national ones. There may be some of those commitments who are part of the commitments, but the, this is probably a case-by-case -case issue so that it's now time for us to work on this so that we clarify and we work on additional opportunities to bring forward. Of course, all these commitments and actions need technical and financial resources. As we have said, and there is more and more institutions opening doors for local and subnational governments. And we also have demonstrated that we can take active role in leadership in terms of it's not always that we ask from national governments, but we can also uh, deliver more uh, guidance, technical uh, experience and capacity, and even resources to a certain extent. And all these have to feed into uh, additional multi-level and multi-stakeholder partnerships. That will be the, the key word in the new phase because uh, it's very clear, as uh, Mayor of Seoul uh, in 2014 said in the UN Climate Summit, that no mayor, no president, no CEO can save this world, say, transform this community on their own. They have to act together, and this year we will have a number of events, Climate Action Summit in D.C. On, in May, Residence Congress traditionally in Bonn this year in July, and this unique year is also for Climate Chance Conference, which brings together all the stakeholders in Nantes in September. So these are, in a nutshell, of uh, what we have experienced in Paris, what we can expect in days ahead, and uh, if, if you have time, of course, we would be happy to take you through some remarkable moments uh, inside and outside the UNFCC. Here are the pictures from the Paris City Hall. Uh, here you can see various events throughout the Blue Zone uh, in the sense that side events and interventions. Um, uh, as we have said, the number and diversity was impressive. 
Uh, this demonstrates our, our strong engagement in the process. And Cities and Regions Pavilion was also a two weeks, two weeks uh, dynamic atmosphere, which was also remarkable, showing the strength and, and our power to support existing commitments. And of course, uh, all these initiatives, in fact, are, are strengthened with existing and ongoing efforts for more than two decades. With this, um, I'd like to make a break uh, and offer the floor for contributions, questions, and answers, which I'm sure would, would uh, be much more enlightening and, 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 and uh, in, in our, our discussion. Uh, and here we are, maybe Luza can help us in that sense. Yes, thank you, Yunus. Um, I want to first remind everyone also that this is your time to type in the questions into the question box in front of you. And then we have received one. Um, I cannot in identify the name, but one of the members of the audience asked, um, should any local official tell citizens who they serve, that a 1.5 degree goal is achievable? Well, this is um, a very good question. In fact, we should, we should be positive in the sense that uh, we all know that the current technology, the current uh, solutions we have, be it in mobility, be it energy, be it waste management or urban planning, if these are implemented, uh, we both have the resources available and we have the knowledge available. We need politicians and we need infrastructure to implement all these goals. And if they're implemented, it can bring us closer to uh, a, a point which is much closer than what we have here today. This is applying for existing cities and existing institutions, but also the new, the newly developed cities and regions all around the world. So I think our officials should be saying that once we're in this track, once we are already shifting our, our investments to this channel, we are confident that we are on the right track and we can the more we accelerate, the more we narrow or peak the, the learning curve, the, the easier we can reach this goal. In that sense, I think we should say yes to this question, but we should also be realistic that if we want a massive transformation worldwide, we need additional uh, changes in the flow of the finances, we need a change in the governance structure, and we also have to tell citizens that they have to demand such services, otherwise uh, it will not be imposed on them, but it should be together with their engagement, and in that sense, access to information, making awareness is a key, key issue, I think. Thank you for that. Um, then we have a question from Ines Carvalho. She is asking what a general citizen could do to support um, the local government actions that ICLI is forwarding? Well, the strength of ICLI's style is that we are building on our experience of over 20 years of uh, work through the Local Agenda 21, which is giving an important mission and mandate to stakeholder engagement. If you look at uh, the successful good practices, both in mitigation and adaptation, you can easily notice that uh, the most important, uh, effective ones are the ones that are received with, with ownership of the citizens, be it local business or uh, uh, neighborhoods or, or the local officials. So in that sense, I think one thing we have to ask our, our citizens that they should approach to their local governments whether they have any climate action plan, whether they have any commitments, and what type of action they're implementing. And in that sense, we have been working over the years in a, in a process called Carbon Climate Registry, which is now the central repository of the Compact of Mayors, which gives you the opportunity at the moment to see which cities have made any commitments or which regions have done so. Of course, ICLA is a voluntary network, so there is no compulsory engagement in the, in the campaign or activities of ICLE. 
but and we also know that there is a huge number of cities and local governments, as, be it in the north or be it in the south, who have not done anything. So this kind of transparency tools and this kind of uh, opportunities for citizens to make their local governments accountable, and if if they are so, this also brings an added value to the local governments that they can tell to their citizens that, look, that's what I'm doing global, that's how I'm contributing to global efforts. That could, I think, would be an opportunity for citizens to be much more actively engaged in this process. And one, I think, very helpful um, experience is also this Earth Hour to Challenge Climate uh, Champions uh, that we have been working in the last couple of years, which is making citizens much more aware of what their cities are doing. So I think we have to increase this kind of initiatives as such. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sandeep Goswami from India. He is asking um, what the role of green businesses or green business ideas as such can be. Um, he's saying that um, when you talk about non-state actors, does that include businesses like uh, green businesses? And um, he's saying that they, are, they always have ideas that they want to put forward, but funding is an issue. So how that can be solved? Well, this is, um, well, first of all, let's start with the non-state actor. Uh, the definition, there's no fixed definition of, of non-state actors, but anybody who has uh, a role to play in the global efforts on climate change and who are not part of the public sector can be called as a non-state actor. That's our interpretation at least. And in that sense, we can say uh, that uh, local business especially is a key part of it because these are the people who are producing services and, and uh, bringing products and technologies where local governments are in a unique position because they can define these typology of, of solutions through their procurement, through their legislation. So concerned and capacitated local governments can open doors to new business, to new technologies and to new solutions. But the, those who are advanced in these areas, they can also work with their local governments to offer them that these kind of solutions exist. So it's kind of like a, um, a win-win situation for everyone. In that sense, the, the networks on procurement, the networks on, on uh, sustainable city business dialogues would be important. And in that sense, ICLE is implementing worldwide a number of initiatives, especially on procurement. And that was launched in Paris as well, a global lead city network. Uh, we also are bringing uh, an additional uh, platform through Metropolitan Solutions Fair, which will be held this year in Berlin, that will bring the business and city officials much more closer. I think these are the type of things we have to consider. And one important point, in the modalities of Green Climate Fund, upcoming Green Climate Fund, uh, there's more and more emphasis to national level implementing entities, which is also giving more opportunities for these national actors to take the lead in implementing projects and, and disperse uh, the global funds. So I think uh, our colleagues should explore this type of initiatives and investments uh, and particularly ask uh, for their municipal councils to have such decisions that they prefer low carbon technologies, uh, low carbon solutions uh, to compare to other obsolete technologies, and they should ask their national governments and global partnerships to, to continue to work on that. Good, thank you. The next Well, question. I read, uh, yeah. Louisa, I read additional notes from Sandeep. Uh, maybe I should mention uh, a bit more about our work in India, because uh, he says that about uh, the, the relation in India. I would recommend you to also reach out to ICLE South Asia Secretariat, which is not in, in India based, which is based in India, but not just only for India. They are serving for Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan. So the, the, there are, for example, in 2009, when there was no national inventories, uh, local governments that are working with ICLE were able to release their uh, energy and, and emission inventories and, and 
at the moment these cities are in the front runners in the smart city models of the national government or solar city projects so the, the 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 more we work with our members and build their capacities the more national governments also can take action forward so i would suggest mr sandeep or Mr. and Mrs. Sandeep Goswami, to also reach out to ICLE South Asia office, uh, and we can also come introduce you after this webinar as well. Good. Another question came um, from Carsten Rotballer. How can the Paris Agreement be legally binding and at the same time does not punish inaction? First question. And secondly, what are the verification and accountability mechanisms foreseen to ensure that 1.5 or 2 degree will be reached? Let's start with the second one. Um, the UNFCC secretary will make regular assessments in terms of what is the commitments, what are I mean, there is a role that the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, is playing uh, with additional scientific research. But the UNFCC Secretariat is making much more political assessment of the current commitments and how much we are closer. And, and there are other institutions like International Energy Agency, they're also making these assessments or outside inst institutions. But all what they are doing is either to alarm bell, saying that, oh, things are going wrong, or even saying that, look, it's not that bad. Things are moving forward, uh, and and to mainly to create a global publicity around which direction are we heading towards. Uh, and 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 coming back to the first part of the question, the it is the Paris Agreement is legally binding in the sense that the national governments will commit to to stick to their nationally developed developed contributions, and in case they cannot reach, they can of course explain the reasons why they cannot make it or they have not done make progress uh, and that there is more a facilitative process which is encouraging what are the barriers that hinder progress. So it's more like uh, not a, a name and shame and, and, and blame game but more like why, why not and how we can do it better. And and that's that's the spirit that of course if they cannot meet their goals they can uh, be offered additional resources or ask for additional efforts and and during this process in 2018 in 2020 and into 2025 the national governments will convene a couple of series of dialogues where they will be asked to strengthen their commitments and once again the only power that they can that can make them change their commitments or contributions is their national actors, which means those who vote for those governments, those who held these governments accountable at the national level should ask what their governments why do they not stick to their uh, commitments or why not they are, they are not getting the opportunities because if they are not meeting their goals, this means that they are not using renewable energies, they are not using public transport, they are not using energy efficient technologies. In fact, being lagged in the process is indicating that in fact these countries are lagging behind the global wave of transformation to a new way of civilization. So it should be in the sense that their interest that if they are not making progress, it means that these countries, the citizens of these countries, are behind a new wave of civilization and they should push that this should change. And the UNFCC or UN process can only help to judge this kind of uh, dialogues and interactions, but they cannot punish any national government as such. Okay, and um, we have another question that came in from the audience. What role for local governments does disinvestment in oil and gas corporations play as far as getting on the right track is concerned? Well, as far as I can understand, the question is trying to understand how local governments are also supporting these initiatives like divestments, 
if this is the question, I can easily say that there is more and more support from local governments because if you look at uh, the, the the basic implementation, uh, there are hundreds of local governments who are, for example, building solar panels uh, into the municipal buildings or shifting from uh, heavy diesel oils to low carbon transport technologies because these are economically viable, these are much providing healthier environment and these are also providing much decent places for livelihoods. And there are also a, a number of local governments who are aiming for 100% renewables and, and these are also growing in number. Uh, these are also driving technology providers and the last but not least, uh, a lot of local governments are also starting to get their pension funds or investment funds out of these companies, especially from their uh, staff uh, funds, uh, that they divest their investments to other areas. And, and, and one final thing is that especially the pipelines, and this has been the case in North America, in the US and a number of other countries, that local and subnational governments, if they believe that fossil fuels is not the future, they are doing their best that environmental legislations are stringent enough that the pipeline projects are also not too much favorable. Uh, and that is already uh, creating a significant support to the global divestment community, I believe. Uh, and these are more or less the way they can play uh, in this process. Very good. Another question uh, came in. A couple of other questions. Rodrigo Messias is asking, um, could you please provide more details on the methods and program of work for the LPAA? How local and subnational governments and networks can further engage this process as members of the LGMA constituency? Well, uh, first of all, greetings to Rodrigo. He is one of the active members of the local and subnational governments constituency, local governments and municipal authorities constituency, representing Energy for SD network of regions. For, and in fact, uh, we are all now looking forward to additional announcements from the French presidency. Uh, we have circulated a number of updates to our partners, members, that in the last couple of weeks, there were certain changes. Uh, for example, we have a new COP president. Uh, there is a new team in the COP22, which is the Moroccan government delegation. Uh, this new uh, refreshments in the delegations and the ways that they, the, 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 the staff who lead this process are more or less now clarified. We have a champion assigned. I think in the next couple of days, we will, should be expecting to hear more uh, clarity from the LPAA leadership and uh, describing us some more uh, options. One option, one likelihood is that out of 12 work stream, uh, there are discussions that there's around 70 initiatives. It may be possible that some of those initiatives may not have uh, a, a lifelong uh, compared to others. That some of them may have longer. Uh, let's say lifetime, they may have more resources and more partnerships, some may lag behind, it all depends because these are all voluntary initiatives, but I think the more we see clarity on uh, roles and responsibilities as Rodrigo mentioned, the more we can feel comfortable that these ideas will, will come into effect, but at the end of the day, let's recall, these are, uh, these are an initiative of the French government and the Peruvian government with UN agencies. So I think the new COP presidencies, the new uh, champions will have to now give us some light. Uh, I'm expecting so that this may help us to prepare in the upcoming new UN climate conference in Bonn in May, so that by that time we see much more clarity. We also have this uh, climate action summit in May in, in Bonn sorry, in, New, in Washington, this could also be an avenue where we may expect some more announcements from the LPA leadership. Thank you, Yunus, for this nice answer. 
Um, there's another question from Joanna Setzer. Um, she's sending her regards, uh, saying thank you for the presentation. And she is asking, how do you see the collaboration between local and regional governments for the implementation of the Paris Agreement at the subnational level? And how can ECLI and other networks support these partnerships? Thanks, Joanna. Uh, we missed you in Paris. Uh, she was in a maternity leave, uh, again, from Energy Foresty. And I think this is the first part is that in this post Copenhagen phase, one of the strength of the local government climate roadmap and the network was the more we unite each other, the more we get together, the more stronger we were and the more confidence we've built in the eyes of the national and global partners. And I think we should continue. The first lesson is that. Um, of course, this, this community or has some uh, issues that sometimes we are acting in the same fields, sometimes we may compete, sometimes we may have conflicting agendas, but at the end of the day, we should be more focusing to increase the pie, to make the pie bigger. As I said, in the case of ICLE, we have around 1,000 cities in our membership, but we all know that in worldwide we have at least a couple of thousands of local and subnational members who have not started anything on, on city action or climate action. I think we have to be able to demonstrate that by collaborating, uh, we can reach out to more cities who have never been involved in this process. We can say that we are not always use, showing casing the usual suspects, but we are increasing new kids on the block so that we increase commitments. And in that sense, I totally agree uh, this uh, we as local and subnational governments should also demonstrate how vertical integration can work effectively. There are cases now, especially in some progressive countries like Canada, where national, provincial and, and urban uh, and municipal uh, administrations are, are having much more dialogues. Or, or in the case of Brazil, this is also becoming a more and more hot issue. And we have also now initiated a number of processes like collaboration between compact of mayors and compact of states, um, or, or strengthening of covenant of mayors, European covenant of mayors, and with those of compact. Some of those initiatives are still a bit vague. We are all aware of it. But at least there is a vision that if we are talking about an ambitious action, there is a role that city governments should play. At the regional level, regional governments should also be providing inputs and guidance or even resources as appropriate. And they should listen to each other instead of competing with each other. Uh, I believe we have to be more specific. So in days ahead, until COP22, maybe we should uh, highlight these kind of multi-level partnerships, showcasing more and more success stories in that sense. Um, but, and then I think we have to be innovative and, and we have to focus on those that are already ready for this kind of mo uh, motivations uh, and maybe we will discuss this more together and once again of course the, the tools that we have developed like compacts or carbon registry can be excellent uh, opportunities for us to, do, to dig in that. Okay, thank you and last but not least we have a technical question. Uh, in your opinion, uh, Yunus, you're asked, will CCS technology, if feasible, help or hinder the movement towards a low-carbon development future? Well, if we are serious about 1.5 degrees goal towards the end of century and carbon neutrality before or after the century, mid-century, it definitely means that in addition to stopping release of emissions from fossil fuels, we have to also remove some of the existing uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere much more rapidly than the way we release. So I'm my personal interpretation, carbon capture and storage should be preferred in the case that, that they speed up the sequestration or removal of the, 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 the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, but it should not be a justification of 
continuing the, the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, if the CCS technology, carbon capture and storage technology, can advance in that track, which is focusing more to remove the, the, the emissions already existing in the atmosphere to be trapped and, and buried down to the earth or, 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 or removed from the atmosphere, that I think would be excellent. Uh, but it should not be uh, a justification to favor fossil fuels compared to the local uh, and, and district uh, renewable uh, sources. And in fact, if you look at the, the cost effectiveness, local renewables are much more advanced and more competitive than the CCS technologies. Uh, but as, as we have seen, once we have started to this 1.5 degrees goal, we have to make use of every additional technology and we have to make anything much better uh, so that these are rolled out massively uh, in the near future. That would be my response. Thank you very much, Yunus, and thank you all for your engagement. Um, we have no further questions at this point. It's mm -hmm. your last chance now. But I think um, we have answered um, all the questions of our audience for today. I think, yes, Louisa, this is true. We also have reached our time limit of one hour, which is, was really uh, lively with the questions and remarks and feedbacks from the audience. We would like to thank you all. Uh, as a concluding remark, I think we would encourage all of you to continue our uh, continue to follow each other, especially the roadmap, and we will also have to decide how we will make use of our existing communication channels and campaigning. We may have to consider some innovative ideas, but definitely we encourage you to follow uh, announcements from ICLE or Roadmap. Uh, but I also would like to add one personal remark, which I made this in the morning session. This 23rd of February is the day uh, that I started to work with ICLE six years ago or seven years ago. I have now completed six years of my career in ICLE. Most of them, most of this time was dedicated to all the debates around climate change. I'm particularly happy that after six or eight years, that the time that I have started, uh, I'm proud and, and honored to, to show that our efforts were not wasted, that we, we built a good outcome and we were a bit more positive than what we used to be before going to Paris. And the, the only way to be confident in the future is that we have to be much more innovative, we have to be much more inclusive. And I think Paris Agreement is giving us this opportunity and we have to seize this opportunity uh, and, and it's it's obvious that we have a new thinking that we can all win or lose together. There's no uh, free riders uh, in anywhere of the world so that we all have to help each other. With these remarks, I'd like to thank you all um, and we, we would can uh, we would certainly share with you the website uh, of once these are uploaded but also we can invite you to subscribe to our newsletters and then continue via further bilateral communication. Thank you. Thanks to you, Yunus, for the interesting presentation and thank you all for your engagement.